All right, uh, we're on. Perfect. Um, so I guess where we start is actually like I, the, the reason why I know about your project is because uh, Sergey, um, I, I've been in, in conversations with him and I had him as Facebook friend for a while and mm -hmm. we connected like in, I think March or something. And he told me that you guys were uh, working on, on this project and just um, maybe it will be great for you to have some like basic intro uh, for me and for anyone that, that will be looking at this. Yeah, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> again, the, the goal of Health Lens right now, uh, which is kind of like the, the interim name of, of this project is really to, uh, I guess the best way of putting it is, we just wanna learn how to build a tool that anyone can use uh, across the globe to try and resolve specific pain points in addressing uh, medical imaging uh, diagnoses. So understanding, uh, you know, when radiologists look at these specific scans, there's a certain amount of time and energy and effort that are spent into looking at and understanding what the uh, problems are that, you know, that a patient is experiencing, you know, why they specifically came in, got the, got the scan, and what the diagnosis is. Um, obviously, with the coronavirus kind of throwing things into in for a loop, we're now looking at uh, what is going to be the impact of the coronavirus in the radiology space, but specifically uh, in the respiratory health space as well. And so we have some ideas or we have some theories that first, if you actually look at radiology today, almost all work has stopped in terms of diagnosis for just all types of different types of conditions. Basically the focus is if it's coronavirus related, let's continue the work. If it's not, you're either going to be a furloughed radiologist uh, or, a <laughs> or you just simply are going to say, look, there's no work, there's no pipeline. So that's actually impacting a lot of radiology clinics just across the nation um, and actually across the world as well. Now here's the problem. What happens when, uh, when hospitals now actually have the capabilities to manage these patients again? Well, there's basically this massive, massive backlog of scans that need to be assessed. And so it goes from, hey, we have no work to, holy shit, we have a lot of work that we have to get through. And so what we want to do is, in the meantime, A, try and find a tool that um, can help these radiologists deal with that, but then B, also try and focus on a specific condition that could come out of this, this uh, coronavirus pandemic. And so there was an, uh, there's an article out there, um, I'll, have to, I'll have to look it up, but basically there's an article out there that talks about um, the coronavirus uh, actually creating permanent lung damage and causing yep. uh, major lung conditions with people who survive coronavirus. One of those is acute respiratory distress syndrome. So the idea here is, do we anticipate that ARDS uh, incidents will actually increase? The number of cases of, of ARDS will increase in the future. And if that's the case, this means that not only will radiologists have to deal with just a metric shitload of these scans and diagnoses that they have to deal with, there could be a significant material increase of these coronavirus survivors that could be uh, contracting um, ARDS in the process. And so we want to try and create a tool for that too. So this is really just a, a learning process for us in understanding, can we create a lightweight, free to use tool uh, to try and uh, help radiologists diagnose ARDS as a part of a larger initiative? That's amazing. And uh, I, I completely agree. There are some, um, you know, second and third order consequences that people and you know, uh, you know, institutions and governments are missing out because they're so like focused on day to day right now, yeah. which is obviously the a much needed focus. But mm -hmm. there are plenty of second and third order consequences that will start uh, popping out, you know, in two three months from now, assuming yeah. that we get through the the peak of the pandemic. And we're we're not just talking about medical issues, but, but there is going to be global supply chain disruptions. There yeah. are very probable scenarios of food deserts even in Midwest US, just because of how things and logistics have changed in the past month. There's gonna be you know, influx of mental health 
disorders and different things uh, associated with uh, the change, changes in environment. Um, even in terms of like coping me mechanisms for grief and stuff like that, like we're already observing that with like funerals in Zoom meetings and, and you know, some other very surreal things, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's very important to start thinking about what happens after. And mm -hmm. that's why I think you guys are very into the, the long-term thinking and strategy. Yeah. Um, to give you a quick background on me, I come from a traditional VC environment. I'm an engineer that turned entrepreneur mm -hmm. and I co-founded this venture studio here in LA. And basically for the past uh, six, seven years, I've been wrangling entrepreneurs and uh, producing from eight to 10 startups per year and getting them to the product market fit and pushing out the, them to the market. And the way we operate is we take a percentage of equity uh, and we do everything possible to actually make the company successful. And that's why partially, you know, the things that, the reason why Corona Y is so like, like amazing and it works is because we have a lot of people that come from startup environment that yeah. are used to be working in uh, environments with high uncertainty and they're able to pull things from nothing and make something happen. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's definitely a skill and I've never uh, seen so many like multidisciplinary intersections as we're observing. And it's the, the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen in my life, which is, uh, absolutely incredible. So the the question is like how <clears throat> how Corona Y can become this platform to launch more of these amazing ideas such as Health Lens or any mm -hmm. others. And we are uh, kind of figuring that out. We're we're building an airplane while flying in it, <laughs> uh, and that's the best analogy to use yeah. here. And we're building um, our core focus right now is AI literature review. Uh, tool, but essentially I'm seeing more and more companies or like let's call it groups of people approaching us with exciting ideas and uh, basically need uh, for us to support them. Yes. Sometimes we can support them, sometimes we cannot and mm -hmm. it's you know a natural ability and filter. I think we can help you guys with you know computer vision engineers, the actual JavaScript engineers as, as you mentioned and the thing that we can also potentially help you is the data sets, though this piece is very, um, you know, contingent on the, the, the actual compliance and the medical records uh, regulation and things like that. Because mm -hmm. essentially, uh, so I, I am sick right now and I'm recovering, but essentially I've, I've been sick for, for a month now, a little bit more. And I, I've been fighting to, to get an x-ray. And mm. that was a, a very, very tough process to convince uh, my doctors uh, mm. to, to actually pre uh, order an x-ray. Um, not even to, to say a CT. The CT is almost impossible for, for me. <laughs> right, right. And I did the x-ray. Uh, I got the result that it was normal. So good news. Oh, good. There's nothing abnormal there. Uh, I also did the antibody test uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, that is negative. And did another nasal swab test, so waiting on results for that. Yeah. Um, but the the thing is that I've actually tried to export my um, medical uh, imaging results, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even when I went through the you know HIPAA compliant procedure of exporting uh, entire medical record. I wasn't able to retrieve the, the actual medical imaging. Uh, mm -hmm. I was able to retrieve the report. So even that, you know, if you imagine that you ask all the, all the potential uh, patients to expert it, they won't be able to do that. Yeah. So the data must come from some, <coughs> some entity that uh, operates that data, whether it be, you know, actual, um, infrastructure like insurance companies that uh, have um, EHR uh, connections 
or it can be individual healthcare providers like Kaiser or any others. Um, the thing is, there is no easy way to establish that, you know, the, the or like anonymized um, kind of dump of data without yeah. uh, triggering major compliance reviews and uh, things that take, you know, six to 12 months to mm -hmm. actually happen. So let me ask you, like, how do you guys think we, we can make it happen? That's a, that's a great question. And that's the part where, uh, you know, rubber kind of hits the road. Um, we've been searching online, you know, just for uh, open data sets of these images from just a bunch of different sources. Um, and, you know, for, for anybody that does watch this afterwards, um, there are actually an incredible number of, uh, data sets comprised of CT scans and x-rays that are out there. The problem with it is for us specifically, selfishly talking about health lens and the problem we're trying to solve, we are looking specifically for ARDS uh, uh, CT scans. So CT scans of patients that have been diagnosed with ARDS. That's kind of tough to find. Like you said, um, x-rays a lot easier to find in general. Uh, CT scans, uh, a little bit more difficult to find in general. Um, CT scans of ARDS patients, I think we found five. <laughs> so we need uh, yes. uh, quite a few more. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the goals of mine actually is to start re reaching out to radiologists of private clinics and trying to understand if, if they actually have the available images where they can effectively strip out the, uh, the I guess, Identif the, what we call uh, P2, which is uh, patient identification uh, information. So identifiable information. So, you know, first name, last yeah, name, yeah, yeah. identifier number, things like that. Right. You know, um, so can we, can we just reach out directly to them, have them strip the information and then provide it to us? Or are there other kind of major uh, contractual um, obligations where they actually would then have to reach out to the patient or something like that? Um, so that's kind of the first place that I want to start. The second one would be to try and find independent research organizations, uh, such as universities, um, who actually have used this data for uh, their own research purposes, and then reach out to them and see if we can we can access that data. So so really just kind of uh, these uh, hail mary attempts at trying to uh, you know collect this data, um, and just kind of seeing where we go from there. I guess. Yeah. And uh, we, we already have connections with, you know, multiple uh, players in, in the market. Uh, okay. For example, um, we definitely had a conversation with the National Institute of Health. We have connections over at uh, WHO, and there are multiple ways to reach uh, specific municipalities. Uh, we have a connection at LA County um, mm -hmm. uh, Public Health Department, uh, and it's just a question of formulating a very specific ask mm -hmm. and having a person dedicated to that communication channel. Because yes. again, if we make, if we fill in that gap, then it's just a question of execution. Yep. And the question of execution is obviously time and resources and they uh, should be willing to cooperate and, and do that. But that's another assumption. You know, we can try. If that doesn't work, we change the strategy. And as you mentioned, there are many strategies to take, but there is limited time frame, and we kind of have to prioritize uh, whichever we think will work the best. Yeah. It will give us the, the biggest uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that's excellent. And, I mean, kudos to you for, for you know, being able to build those, those connections to those organizations. I mean those are global organizations that have a lot of reach and a lot of cloud, especially the NIH um, in terms of, you know, designing and developing these types of solutions. So that would be. Immediate. Yeah. And we don't have like a centralized, you know, it's not like we have daily calls with them. So it's not mm. to overhype the potential, sure. but yeah. it's like the, you know, granular connections here and there that can potentially yeah. get us through the, the noise. So, yeah. which helps. Absolutely. So, um, and in terms of how your team uh, is structured, how, how many uh, of, uh, of people do you have on your team and where can you help with this process of communication? Yeah, so I would probably say that we've got almost like 
I want to call it uh, three full-time volunteers, <clears throat> myself, Sergi, and Anatoly. Uh, Sergi and Anatoly, let's just call them the, the brains of the operation in that, just because I have none, uh, but they are the ones that are, you know, the, exactly. the engineers and the product developers. Um, they're, they're truly the architects of, of the overall solution. Um, my goal here is to try and understand how can we then create a connection between the actual tool and what the what radiologists are actually looking for. So trying to solve you know some of those uh, more conceptual questions on you know what the solution looks like, how can we actually get into their hands, and at the same time, can we try and do this without breaking any laws? So uh, that's yeah. kind of the the, the value add that that I have there. We also have a few other um, part-time volunteers um, as well. Um, you know, a handful of, of machine learning uh, engineers that are you know just kind of waiting for for the, the data sets. Um, thanks to you as well, we have uh, uh, Aman Chowdhury as well. That's that's going to be uh, working with us. We have a conversation with them slated for Monday, actually that we're you know really looking forward to. And then we have a, a really really awesome, just brilliant. Um, uh, product and UX designer by the name of Jeff Shaw that's you know offering you know some of his time as well so you know shout out to Jeff as well for you know for his in incredible work that he's done so far. Um, Do you have so, this team somewhere like in, in one Google Doc or uh, some website? Sorry you, you cut out for just okay. a second or two what was that? Do you have this team on like one Google Doc or like a website or something? that we can use because essentially let's imagine that uh, we allocate a person to lead this communication. We work together on creating a Google doc, uh, like why these organizations should care about us and uh, how we can help them because that's the, the actual usefulness of our corporation. Uh, the, the next question is like, how, you know, legit are you guys? Like, are you doing this for real or is it just mm -hmm. you? Uh, or like, is there a couple people and, and things like that? Because again, these organizations won't really, you know, place their bets on, on some group of people that is not viable or sustainable. Yes. And we, we need to kind of de-risk that uh, yeah. for that. Absolutely. So three, three things that I want to say. First, uh, to, to answer your first question, which was, you know, who would be the point of contact? Uh, so I would volunteer to be the point of contact in this instance, just just because it it likely makes the most sense, and I probably have the most bandwidth. Okay. Um, then I want to answer the Google Doc question. We're actually in the process of uh, finalizing that. Um, what we want to do is uh, actually use that as just like a, a first stop shop to learn about what Health Lens is. So if you're a volunteer joining the organization um, to contribute some of your time, we owe you just a very brief overview of what we're trying to achieve and who's actually there. And then what are the key links and information that, that you need to read up on as quickly as possible. And then we can provide that to you as well as just kind of like a, hey, this is an organization that needs your help, you know, whether it's NIH or the WHO or whomever else. Um, here's just a quick read through of them. Um, now, finally, the third and most important question, are we, how legit are we? Uh, so, you know, I would actually say that we, have a, a tool that we're designing. Um, it's going to first focus on um, being able to analyze the lung and uh, specific anatomy within the lung. And so what we want to do is we want to achieve a certain level of uh, success rate in being able to train this model to do so, um, and then be able to establish it in kind of a format that, that people can actually view. So TBD on that, that's something that, um, again, Anatoly and, and Sergey are literally heads down on as we speak, trying to you know, finalize that. But once we actually have that, we wanna put that in front of uh, a few radiologists and other clinicians, just to show that A, we are legitimate, and B, we want some of your feedback to actually start tweaking and improving this, this uh, user experience specifically so that you can actually use it. So. Yeah, and what we've learned, and I mean, I've learned the, uh, this through the years, but like specifically in the past two months, having a wrong answer is better than not having any answer. Yes. So even having a landing page, because I, I checked out if you had a website and it doesn't seem like you do, like yep. even having screenshots of something like something that looks shitty, you yeah. know, at, at least explains what will be the end result will yeah. be very, very helpful for us to, you know, pitch this to any organization. Yeah, 
I can't tell you how many times we've, you know, created a startup with just an awful landing page, got berated by customers and users, and we're like, thank you for throwing pies in our faces. We will take yeah, it. That's the, the mentality. Yeah. I, so again, let's, um, let's summarize this. We, uh, we definitely need to organize uh, all of the information about the project. Uh, we need to um, dedicate some thinking into structuring communications uh, team and yeah. outline the ideal um, you know, stakeholders, the, the players in, in the market that will be um, you know, the easiest to reach and will lead the most uh, you know, outcomes. And that's probably the, the core things to focus right now. Yep. Yep, absolutely. And then once we once we actually create that kind of communication structure, uh, and then actually have it established on something as basic as a Google Doc, uh, we'll send it over to you along with a clear ask of, you know, this is the problem that we're running into. This is what we need in order to get rid of that blocker. Um, and then, you know, hopefully that can that can be enough to start, you know, reaching out to to any sort of entity that that thinks that you know they can help provide us with that. Sounds like a plan. Perfect. Arthur, thank you so much. This is really helpful and just overall just super, you know, inspiring and uh, a great source of energy. So thank you. Yeah, we're, we're all in this together. That's the, the beauty of this whole pandemic. Uh, it kind of opened up uh, eyes for many of us that we, we actually, you know, should be doing some inspiring things and should be doing some things that are beyond our kind of like day to day and like commute and, you know, just like venture. Yeah money and all of these things they all seem irrelevant like i i i get that for some people it's uh, you know less and more mm -hmm. but for me specifically like uh i just i just can't ignore this uh, yeah. whole thing and yeah. i feel many people can too and i feel that's why at prono why we got this group of highly intelligent highly cooperative and you know motivated individuals that are not motivated by, you know, Kaggle prizes or like, you know, some, you know, public recognition. It's really right. about collaborating and making an impact. I was watching actually some of the other uh, YouTube videos is just like the uh, kind of the, the catch up sessions that you guys have recorded and, and put up on YouTube. And it's clear to see that the, the levels of collaboration are almost like unparalleled with, with any other organizations. Just people trying to solve this shit. Um, yeah. It's really, really cool to see. Can't understand anything they're saying. <laughs> exactly. Uh, trust me. Still, super inspirational. <laughs> You're not alone, you know? <laughs> I, I just sit on the, these calls and I'm like, okay, yeah, it probably <laughs> makes sense. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Cool. Arthur, Sounds thank crazy. you so much. Yeah, yeah thank, talk to you soon. Thank you. And I'll be uploading this video and posting it in the channel. Perfect. All right. Thanks again. Sounds good. Bye. Cheers. Bye.